Hi, my name is Isman and uh, welcome to this introduction to Geodata. We we'll start out with a formal definition of Geodata. We might say that Geodata is all about representing what is, was and will be where, when. So, given that, we can say that the typical use of Geodata is to represent tangible aspects of our physical world such as roads, land cover, buildings, etc. Geodata is also often used for representing more abstract elements of our world such as atmosphere boundaries, zip codes, school districts, etc. The Geodata can uh, also be used for representing things that are not of our physical world, if you wish, such as scenarios, so sea level rise, where would the shoreline be given a sea rise of one meter, or even master plans for new development of urban built up areas. A common misunderstanding about Judith is that it is related to quantitative data and only quantitative data. It is easier to do an analysis of quantitative data, but data can also be used for representing and is also used for representing qualitative data. An example could be interviews where I mean you go through the interviews, you relate each interview segment to a location so that you have a collection of people's remarks about specific locations. It's common to talk about geodata as being comprised of these three components the attribute data, the what, so what soil type, what land cover type, what street name, the temporal data, the when, when was the street built, when was the data registered and the spatial data the where that's of course the most important part or interesting part so where is this street or where is this post district if you look at one of my favorite demos of this type of data this uh, website one million treats we um, can see we have an update of the last one million treats at a global level and if we uh, zoom in to a small area, so if I can get a zoom here, and I can zoom in on Europe, we can see the distributions of tweets around Europe. We can have the data displayed as such with dots we can zoom in on, or we can have a heat map so we can see okay exactly where are the tweets coming from, and surprise, surprise, most tweets come from. Uh, the large cities. We can also do a search for a specific term. Let's look for refugees. So here we have all tweets about refugees. Of course most of them, I spelled it in English, are from England but we have one here where we can see what is this tweet about and here we have the attribute data. So the attribute data is here Thank you very much for your kind donations and so on. So this is the attribute data. We have the temporal data down here. Now that was when was this tweet sent. And we have the spatial data that is here. Where was the data sent from? So this simple example shows you both attribute data, temporal data and spatial data. If um, we look at the temple and the attribute data, they're, they're basically relatively trim, trivial in this context. Uh, basically some short comments is that the temple data can have two roles. It can be when an event happened, so when was this or that forest fire, or it can be when was the event registered, when was this geodata created. So we have two aspects of the temple element in play here. 
the attribute data of course can be all those classical types such as text and numbers or so, but also remember that it can be video recordings and sound recordings or photographs. So it not does have to be those classical elements that we have in our attribute data. The spatial information, that's the where, which is of course what most of this course is about. Um, in its simplest case, it's basically a coordinate pair, x and a y, specifying a place or give, matching a place to a location on the surface of the Earth. Um, one such coordinate system is based on the concept of latitude and longitude, so that is degrees north and south of the crater and east and west of Greenwich. This coordinate system can be specified in many ways and we'll talk much more about it later, but just to start out with. So in this system, the location of the Oscar University would be 12.14 degrees east of Greenwich and 55.65 degrees north of the crater. But as I said, we'll talk much more about how coordinate systems function and how they are specified later. It's important to remember that geodata is always, or nearly always, an abstraction. So whenever we take something that is not digital, so not tweets, but anything else from the real world, it must undergo a series of abstractions before we can create it into geodata. We often operate with three layers of abstractions and I'll talk you through these three layers in the following. The first layer of extraction of the reality must undergo, so is, must be conceptualized. We must have some terms that we talk about. Basically, if you don't define a table, we can't say that here's a table. So we create what we call entities, that's physical things, objects, and property spaces, so that is a field such as temperature, that is not has defined, but is defined everywhere basically. So, a entity is an object at a given location, while a property space is a property that is distributed across space, such as temperature, air pressure, and so on. These together give what we call an ontology. Ontology um, is basically Greek meaning what really exists. So the first thing we do is that we define what really exists in our world. If you look at this real world here, we have um, some elements of it. We can then take our ontology and look through it and what we see we generally call our world of observation. In this case we will see rivers, roads, trees, buildings, soil units, perhaps municipalities, train elevation and wind speed. That's some of the things that we can see in our world. As I mentioned a entity is a representation of the phenomenon that can be seen as a whole and is described by an attribute or by attributes that are homogeneous throughout this whole. So buildings can be described by their heights, building material and so on. A property space is a representation of a phenomena that varies continuously throughout space, such as wind speed, terrain elevation, and so on. The ontology of geodata consists of three main components. The definitions, so what is there, so we talked about in this case, buildings, so on. There can also be classifications. Soil units are not objects as such, they are a result of a classification. And there can also be which properties are we interested in looking at, are we registering temperature, elevation, and so on. Our ontology will also have to relate to our posi position or resolution of our agitation. So 
we have two concepts that we use here. The minimum mapping unit, so that is how small things can we see. Can we see the grass at the foot of a pylon? Is that large enough to prevent us to a grass area? How many trees do we need in order to talk about a wood? So that's a minimum uh, mapping unit. We'll also relate to the amount of detail we can see. So how precise do we do our temple registration? Do we say, okay, this forest was built the 4th of December 1980, or do we say this was built in the 80s? And we also have to talk about, or can also include in our anthology, our spatial constraints. Are objects allowed to overlap? It's not very practical if buildings overlap. But forest fires, if we are registering forest fires, well, the same area can be burnt down in a forest fire one year, and then perhaps 10 years later, it will also have a forest fire in it. So some things can be overlapping, some can't. We have a oil constraint sort of connectivity or connectiveness. So do roads have to meet up at road junctions? Well, it does make it much easier to do modeling if they do. And finally, if we have things like completeness, do we, read it? Do we have data everywhere? Or are there holes that we have? So these are the basic components that we have in our ontology. We have define what we can register, the definitions, object types, classes, phenomena, the precision at which we register, and also which spatial constraints we have on our data. The next level of abstraction our real world of observation has to go through is that it has to go from the analog space to a discrete space. We can do this in different ways. We can use objects to register, say, this is the area that is occupied by a building. This is an area occupied by a road. Or this is the place occupied. Find them as points, lines and polygons. We can also use what well, it's commonly known as rasters, but I guess in the formal term is a regular tessellation where we subdivide our area into small squares typically and then register what is within each of these squares. And finally, a, our way of doing it is to use triangular irregular networks, TIN. These are mainly used for representing surfaces such. Um, but we'll talk about all of these in greater detail in a short moment. Our objects, basically as I said, we have points, lines and polygons. They can all be given by an X and a Y or an X and Y and a Z value. We have one coordinate. Lines basically consist of a series of points and assuming that that series of points are connected by straight segments. Areas is a series of points that where the first and the last point is the same, so it constitutes a ring. And if there is an R ring inside it, it might constitute a hole, so we have a island inside a lake. Volumes are less common, but are beginning to appear in different geodata connections, so volume is typically represented as a mesh of triangles that enclose a volume such as a building or whatever or perhaps even a little dolphin. Our regular situations, rasters, we probably know them from a digital photograph. A digital photograph consists of cells called them pixels, picture elements, where we assign a value to each cell, which in the case of the picture is how much light is reflected as red, green or blue. In geodata, we don't 
a sign that reflects a light, but it will be typically things such as each square is assigned the elevation over the sea level or temperature or whatever it is that we are using it to represent. So we can look at it like this and see if we have all these small squares. Sometimes the squares cover an area of two different types or many different types and we have to have different rules to decide what is assigned to the individual squares. Also note that if we have a line in a raster it will have an area. We can't make a line with no area. It will always have the width, minimum width of one raster cell. Same goes for points. Points can only be small can't be smaller than one raster cell. The tins, the triangular irregular networks, are typically used for mountainous non-glacial landscapes because we have these rugged structures. The basic element is that we construct a surface based on triangles, we call them faces, and each corner of these triangles meets up with another triangle and they share elevation data or whatever it is in this model so that in that way we can construct a full surface. Today most data comes as two-dimensional but we are in a transition zone where we have more and more 3D data coming along, more and more advanced 3D data coming along. So we find that we have not only XY data sets but XYZ data sets. It's not really true due data. We can't make what we call voxels volumes are not really often used. It occurs but it's seldom. The typical um, element is that we have we work in a two-dimensional and environment and we only use the three-dimensional for visualizations. There is, uh, however, quite a lot of tools for working with special 3D elements in your surfaces. So, um, surfaces such as terrain surface, where we can do calculations of how water runs off the surface. 3D analysis and visualization, apart from this, is, however, relatively limited. We can't, you know. Some of you might have played games like Minecraft where you have small cubes that you can build things up and make 3D worlds in this. That is not the case with uh, 3D data in, uh, in, in, in Geodata yet. Although there are some software packages that can operate on what is called voxels, that is small cubes rather than small squares. We often have this concept of combining our spatial data and our attribute data. How is that done? Well, basically there's two different approaches. In raster data, we typically have the attribute data associated directly with the individual cells. So we have in each cell, instead of having the color, we have the temperature or the elevation above sea level. In vector data or object data, we typically have a series of data representing the spatial element, so a series of XY or XYZ coordinates, and then some form of link to a database table describing the attributes, so, you know, as you know from Excel. Many software packages then hide this link from you and then display it as one, so you have a row and column view where you have both your spatial and your attribute data connected. The final abstraction that we'll be talking about is that the data has to be stored in a digital form. So we have now converted, we have our ontology that defined our elements. We converted from the analog world to the discrete world. And now we have to take these discrete elements and store them on the computer. There are literally more than 200 different data formats for doing this. 
those that you probably um, meet can be categorized into four rough classes. XML files, you might have met KML, which is used in Google Earth. And there are also software such as GML. And another one that you might come across is GPXP, GPX, sorry, uh, which is used for handling data from GPSs. We have dedicated files for storage of geodata. So if you want to store them on the hard disk, you could do them as shape files, if, or tab files, or geotiff files. That's the simple, straightforward storage on, the, on your hard disk. Geodata is often a bit more complicated than it's practical, so it's not practical to use these um, simple storage files. So we often use databases where we can have different types of geodata collected together. There's two, basically two types of, um, of, geo, of databases. We have what we call serverless databases. So they are really basically just files, file structures on your hard disk. But they have an internal structure that you then can read through. Some of these files that you'll meet is Microsoft Access, the MDB files. You have SQLite. You have if you're using um, the S3 packages, you have what is called a file geodatabase, and you also have a type called NetCDF, which is typically used for handling hierarchical multi dimensional data, um, climate models, and that type of thing is often distributed as NetCDF databases. And then, of course, we have the real databases, the server-based databases, such as Postgres, Oracle, Microsoft SQL. And these all have special elements or packages for handling geodata. So Postgres has a package called PostGIS. Oracle has Oracle Spatial. The same goes for Microsoft, it's called uh, Microsoft Spatial. And finally we have, again, Esri. They have produced a structure called ArcSDE, which can run on different databases. And then is their way of storing geodata in a standard database. So, all of this is about we have our reality. The reality is seen through an ontology that generates entities and property spaces. These are organized as files. These files are loaded into our GIS software as layers and then from there we produce maps. As you might understand, there is quite a lot of operations going on in this transition from real world to map. And quite a lot of the errors that we experience in the use of GIS is related to not understanding the complexity of this. If we look at a, um, a little story here, we can tell the story about a group of researchers who wanted to study how the development of meadows has been for time in Denmark. So they went to the Danish cadastral and got topographical maps from different periods from 1900, 1980 and 2014. And then they looked at what had happened and if you look in the period from 1900 to 1980, it look, appears that these meadow areas have disappeared. There's not so many meadow areas on the 1980 map. But quite a lot of them have reappeared again in the 2040 map. So what is going on here? 
have the farmers drained the land in the period from 900 to 980, optimize the farming, and then in the period from 80 to 2014, they have stopped and re-established natural areas. Or is it something else? Well, you could go back and look at who had requested the data, the role of the data requester. So some, whenever geodata is created, someone has requested it to be created. In traditionally, this was the military. So in the 1900 map, what was registered as meadows was registered from a military point of view. So it is a question about the possibility. How easy can you get your troops through this area? And how much cover can they find in it? So the meadows is defined as low grass, perhaps even wet grass. In the 1970s, things changed. Uh, emphasis was on biological diversity. So the meadow, as we see it in the 1980 maps, is probably defined as areas where we have a special type of vegetation that can only occur if the area hasn't been tilled in a period. And back in 2014, well, it might, the people that has requested the data could be interested in EU subsidies. So what type of use is that? So is it for a crop rotation or is it for permanent grassland? So the data requester can have had different interests and thus changing the definitions of the data. The data requester has then sent their request to the data modeler that has defined what is a meadow in computer terms or whatever terms have been used. It's been sent out to a data harvester that has gone out and collected the data in the field. This data has been stored by data managers. So all of the data I've seen here have been collected as Danish topographical maps. There has then been a data analyst who has been looking at them and saying, okay, what do I see? What are the meadows? And then finally, this has been sent, presented by figures and maps for an audience. And all through this process, you have to be very much aware of what have the other people in this string of people working on the geodata. What have their, their intentions been? Can we trace it back? Can we ensure that we are not telling a story about different data requesters' interest in what a meadow is, but we're telling a story about how much land was covered by meadows in the different periods. So using geodata is not quite, it's not necessarily easy. There's lots of elements that you have to look at in understanding and ensuring that your data is right. Another example I've come across lately is rooftops. Well, it turns out that then Denmark are rooftops with roads on top of it. And that's because a rooftop can also be what covers a garage. And if you have an underground garage, you can easily have a road on top of a roof. So Understanding these elements are very important for the use of Judea. Thank you.